ultimate battle ends with the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. The enemy's weapon of choice in the struggle is deception. He uses falsehood to deceive the masses. But what can we do to guard against the end of days deception? Family, we are getting closer and closer to the end. We are in a fight. And if you don't understand that, you're already at a disadvantage. It all began in the garden. Let's read this from Genesis 3.15. The Most High is speaking to the serpent. He says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. Her seed? Isn't it a bit strange for him to say her seed? He shall bruise your head. Hmm. You shall bruise his heel. This is the ultimate battle. What is the battle about? It's about everything that Adam lost that had to be restored to include the intimacy and spiritual connection to the father. It was not just about the restoration of Israel. It says the seed of the woman would bruise the head of the serpent. So this is to be a deadly wound. Now throughout the ages, we have seen how the descendants have been impacted because this was a declaration of war. Unfortunately, the majority of Yah's people don't even know that they're involved in this battle. Revelation 12, 7 through 9 tells us, And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old. Call the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. He deceives the world, it says. What's the title of this message? Guard against end of days deception. If he deceives the whole world, is it possible for some to escape the deception? Let's see. Listen to what Messiah says here in Matthew 24, 24. False Christ and false prophets will rise. And what are they going to do? They will show great signs and wonders. Why? To deceive they're doing it to deceive. Then he says, if possible, even the elect. Then he says, see, I have told you beforehand. He said, if possible, these great signs and wonders would deceive even the elect. He's saying, I'm telling you this beforehand so you will recognize it when it happens. What is going to protect the elect from the deception? Let's look at this from Luke 22, 31 through 32. Messiah is speaking to Peter. He says, Simon, Simon, indeed Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. So what would be Peter's anchor? His faith. The enemy would try to shake his faith. And we can see that Messiah says, when you have returned, when you return to what? The word. He returned to that place of truth. Now let's see what Peter says later in 1 Peter 1, 3 through 5. He tells the believers that the Father has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Messiah from the dead. He said, we are begotten or born again 
unto an inheritance that is incorruptible and undefiled. So he's restoring what Adam lost. He says, this will not fade away and it is reserved in heaven for us. But listen to what he says in verse five. He says, we are kept by the power of Yah through faith unto salvation that is ready to be revealed, ready to be revealed in the last time or the last days. Now, what is the anchor? Believing the word that was sent from the Father, Yah sent his word to heal us and deliver us from destruction. The work that he was sent to do is our hope. The word made flesh was our sacrifice. Listen to this from Isaiah 53, 1-3. Who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Most High been revealed? To whom has he been revealed? Who's the Father's right arm? His begotten Son. But he has to be revealed. For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant. He shall grow up. So he, in the flesh, he begins as a child, the last Adam. And as a root out of dry ground, he has no form or comeliness. And when we see him, when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. I want you to hear this exchange between Yeshua and Pilate. He's standing before Pilate, and Pilate is questioning him. And listen to how he responds. He says, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Yehudis. But now my kingdom is not from here. Pilate therefore said to him, are you a king then? Listen to his answer. Put your spiritual ears on. You say rightly that I am a king. Pause, family. He tells him he is a king, but his kingdom is not of this world. Then where else is his kingdom from? Heaven. Are there two kings in heaven? Does this not line up with Revelation 19.16? He is the king leading the army, not the captain. This lines up with Isaiah 9. The child is born, the son is given. He had the authority as king before he came here. He had a kingdom. He says, you say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born. And for this cause I have come into the world that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. So I hope you will hear his voice. It also lines up with Isaiah 54, 5. You will see in this verse that Israel's maker is her husband. Her creator, the creator, is her husband. It's the Most High Yah. Notice that it says he is also her redeemer. The Holy One of Israel is her redeemer. Now, didn't scripture say the son was sent to redeem? Here it identifies him as the Holy One of Israel. Let's go on because I get comments from folks who say Messiah is not in the Old Testament. Those words are shocking to me because he is literally all through the Old Testament. And as we go on, you will see that these words can be about no one else but him. So listen, Isaiah 53, four through six. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten 
Baya, and afflicted. Did that happen to David or one of the other kings of Israel? Let's go on. He was wounded for our transgressions, our sins. He was bruised, there's that word, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way and the Most High has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Continuing, we're looking at verses seven through nine. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter. Was David slaughtered or did he die in old age? And as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. Who else are we talking about here? And who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living for the transgressions of my people. He paid the price for the people of the Most High. He was stricken and they made his grave with the wicked. Who did that happen to? But with the rich at his death, because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Now let's look at this, Isaiah 53, 10 through 11. Yet it pleased the Most High to bruise him. There's that word again. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, his soul was an offering for sin. Now, don't miss this. The father gave his own offering for sin. This is the interpretation of what Abraham was told when he saw the ram in the bush. It says he shall see his seed. The father will see his seed. What's the father's seed, family? The word made flesh. It's the same seed being referenced in Genesis 3.15. This is why he said the seed of the woman, because she received this seed directly from the father. Let's pause and take a look at this. Let's look at sperma from Strong's Concordance. It's 4690. So sperma that which is sown, i.e. seed, a seed commonly of cereals, offspring, descendants. So a man will place his seed in a woman. She conceives to bring forth his descendants, his posterity. What did Mary receive into herself? Sperma. It comes from the one who carries it. Men carry seed. Women receive and give birth to it. It does not originate with her. The seed that was sent from the Father is his word, his word that was made flesh, the life-giving force. Now, for those who may be struggling with that, think about creation and go back and read what happened during creation. The creation is the Father releasing the life-giving force from his mouth. And Yah said, and Yah said, whatever he said manifested. It originated in him though. The life-giving force emanating from his mouth executed what he said. Think of it this way. The word is his power personified. He's a person. He makes the invisible known or visible. How was Adam conceived? Stop and think about that for a second. Because the Most High formed him of the dust of the ground. Did that give him life? No. He was just a lifeless body. But then he breathed into his nostrils. 
the breath of life and he became a living soul. He breathed the life-giving force into his nostrils. That force comes out of the Father. The force is released when he speaks. He speaks it into existence. When Gabriel gave Mary the word, it contained the power to produce life in her, just like it did when the Most High breathed life into Adam. Let's go back to the passage in Isaiah 53. It says, he shall see his seed. He shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days and the pleasure of the Most High shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied by his knowledge, by his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Who did this? Messiah. He did this. The Most High created the first Adam. Adam reproduced after his kind. Well, how would the Father reproduce after his kind? Just think for a moment. He needed to send the last Adam into the earth. He needed to be born of a woman, but the woman can only receive seed. It does not originate with her. What has to happen? Yah has to say something. He speaks it into existence. The woman has to receive it so that it can come forth in a human body, just like the first Adam. Luke 1, 26-35 tells us what happened when the angel Gabriel was sent from the Most High to Mary. He appears to her, it says, In the sixth month the angel Gabriel was sent from Yah unto a city of Galilee. He was sent to a virgin, espoused to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David. It says the virgin's name was Mary. So this angel came to her. He greets her. He tells her that she's highly favored, that the Most High is with her, and she's blessed among women. And when she saw him, she's troubled by this saying, what in the world does all of this mean? Then this angel says to her, don't fear, Mary, for you have found favor with Yah. Now he gives her the word. You will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son. She is told this. You're going to have a child. His name is going to be Yeshua. He's going to be great and called the son of the highest. The Most High is going to give unto him the throne of his father David. He shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. Of his kingdom there shall be no end. Now Mary's really confused. She's like, how can this be, seeing that I know not a man? Even though she's a spouse to Joseph, they have not been intimate. So the, it, this angel tells her how. The Holy Spirit's going to come upon you, and the power of the highest shall overshadow you. So know that this holy thing, which shall be born of you, shall be called the son of Yah. Family, what happened when Adam ate from the tree? We all died. We were all born into sin. Wouldn't that include Joseph? But this angel is telling her, this baby is not going to be of Joseph. And we know it's not because she's saying, I have not been with a man. Now it says Joseph, her husband, being a just man, wasn't willing to make a public example of her. This is why he was considering putting her away because she was found to be with child already. The child was to be born, but the son was given. The child needed a body so that the body could grow and be the sacrifice. The son already had the essence of the father. The fullness of the Godhead was already in him. Mary received sperma, the seed to bring forth the child. The father says he will reveal this to those who are his. Now, 
If you cannot believe that Yah can place a child in Mary's womb, why do you believe he created Adam from dirt and breathed life into him so that he could become a living soul? The last Adam is coming into the world in a similar manner. Adam came from the father as a son. If Joseph was the father, what would make him divine? Joseph was born into sin and so was Mary. The lamb had to be without blemish. So verse 20 tells us, while Joseph is thinking about these things, I'm going to put this woman away because she's carrying somebody else's child. An angel appears to him saying, fear not to take unto you, Mary. That which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She is going to bring forth this son, and this is what his name is going to be called. He's given his the purpose for this child. His name is to be Emmanuel. What does Emmanuel mean? Yah with us. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as this angel said. He took unto him his wife. But listen to verse 25. He knew her not. He was not intimate with her till she had brought forth her firstborn son. Her firstborn son. She received the seed so that she could bring forth this child. The child was born. The son was given. If you read John 20, 20 through 23, you're going to see what happened after Messiah's resurrection. He showed himself to the disciples and then told them, as the father has sent me, I am now sending you. What did he do next? He breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Why? What was being restored? the spiritual connection that was lost in the garden so that the Holy Spirit wouldn't just come upon and lift, he would be in us. How did Adam become a living soul? Now let's look at this from Hebrews 5, 12 through 14. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you. Again, the first principles of the oracles of Yah. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age. That is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Did you catch that? Why is it saying they need to have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil? Which tree did Adam and Eve eat from? The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But those who are mature will have their senses exercised because that's where it all began in the garden. This journey that we're on is the fulfillment of what happened there. Let's go back to that. Let's look at Genesis 2, 8 through 9. The Most High planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground, the Most High made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst, in the middle of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Messiah came so that he could deal with Adam's sin. He had to deal with that first. Now, we may blame Adam and Eve for what happened, but in this life, we're still faced with the dilemma they faced. On a daily basis, we have to make decisions about good and evil. There's only one way to do that. You have to be intentional about choosing life. He placed life in his begotten son. But where did it originate? It originated in the bosom of the father. It came out of him. His word was sent to give us life. 
the words coming out of the mouth of the Father, Torah, is the life-giving force that was made flesh. So it's what you know and understand about that truth that gives you life. The enemy's trying to shake it. He wants to do with you what he did with Eve. Well, did he really say that? Well, that's not really what he meant. So you will either believe and live or doubt and die. Because they doubted and they chose to believe the word of the serpent, they died spiritually. And later they died in the natural. Let's look at this verse again, Genesis 3:15. And I will put enmity between you and the woman. Did you notice that it says, the Most High place the enmity between the two. The opposition starts here. It's by design. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. The two are supposed to bruise each other. They are at war. Let's look at synonyms for enmity from Merriam-Webster. So enmity, it's hostility, animosity, and animus, and all indicate deep-seated dislike or ill will. True hatred, either overt or concealed. Hostility implies strong, open enmity that shows itself in attacks or aggression. Animosity carries the same of anger, vindictiveness, and sometimes the desire to destroy what one hates. Animus is generally less violent than animosity, but definitely conveys active prejudice or ill will. So this is hatred and a deep-seated dislike or ill will. Question, who put the enmity there? The Most High did. So this enmity will continue while there is a godly and a wicked seed on this earth. There are those who feel some kind of way about you and you can't figure it out. What is it? What did I do? Until you realize that you don't have to do or say anything, you will ignore the traps they set. It has everything to do with who you are and your assignment. The Most High has placed an anointing on you to influence and draw men unto himself. They do the opposite. They draw men unto the serpent. Remember Simon the sorcerer in Acts 8? It's appropriate that he's called Simon the sorcerer because that is what motivated him. He influenced men through sorcery to draw men unto the serpent. Don't be deceived, family. The enemy already know that he has to guard against the head crushers. Deception is the principal instrument used by the serpent to unleash his fury. It serves as his defense. The enemy's head is the chief seat of his life. Where is his head? It's on the ground, the place where men walk. A man could easily tread on his head and crush it to pieces. You are a head crusher. Head crushers are dangerous to him and his mission. So he uses deception to trip men up. What's going to protect the elect from deception? Let's look at this from Psalm 119, 105. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. When you are aware that danger is all around you, you tend to pay attention and you watch where you walk. This world is full of darkness and a lamp is needed to light your path. Why? So that you can see the serpents trying to bruise your heel. He knows that he has to bruise the heel of the seed of the woman to trip them up. And where do serpents hide out primarily? In low places, normally on the ground. So if you're not careful about where you place your feet, it may strike you. 
He's subtle, always looking for those who are not paying attention because the heel is the part that is most within the serpent's reach. So they will lay low until they have the perfect opportunity to strike. They watch you. They look at how you walk, where you walk, not to imitate righteousness, but to stop you from walking. Normally when people are walking, they're going somewhere. They have a destination and the job of your enemy is to stop you from getting there. Why? The success of those who are being led by the Most High contributes to his demise. So he will look for every opportunity to vex, to bruise, oppress, and ultimately kill the seed of the woman. But look at this in Psalm 119, 110. The wicked have laid a snare for me, yet I have not strayed from your precepts. The word of Yah serves as a protector, even though he laid a snare. Those who will allow the word of the Most High to light their path will not be caught up in that snare. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. The word has to be hidden in your heart. When the enemy comes with deceptive words, it is the word that will rise up on the inside of you to refute it. You can say, it is written, thou shalt not. And he will do that because that is who he is. He is the word of Yah made flesh. He abides in our heart. The enemy, though, will try to block that word from entering into your heart because a changed heart is a changed mind. Listen to what it says here in Lamentations 1.16. For these things I weep. My eye, my eye overflows with water because the comforter who should restore my life is far from me. My children are desolate because the enemy prevailed. Who's speaking? Jerusalem personified as a woman. Why is she weeping? Because the enemy has prevailed over her children. They are now far from her and she can't be comforted. They're not in the land. But pay attention to what she says. The comforter who should restore my life is far from me. She's speaking about the Ruach, the word in spirit form. The words of Yah are spirit in life. So we have an example of the children falling into the trap that was set by the enemy, and they've been taken into captivity. What did the serpent begin with? Deception, seduction, he will always offer something that you want. This is the job of evil spirits, familiar spirits. They watch you. They look for ways to entrap you. They look at the family tree to see, well, what got your father? What got your mother caught up? Your grandfather, your grandmother. They look at things you desire like power and position. Do you always want to be praised? because he'll make sure you get that. But there's a desired end. It's to stop you from walking uprightly. He wants to destroy you or place you in a position where he can use you so others can be destroyed. So there is a continual conflict between Yah's people and him. Heaven and hell can never be reconciled. And this is why we have to guard against deception, the battle between good and evil. So I want to share some things with you so that you can see just how devious the enemy is. This is the final hour family and you have to guard the truth that is in your heart like your life depended on it. Now, if you're all over the place, then truth's not rooted and grounded in you and you have a lot of work to do. You will be low-hanging fruit for the enemy because your foundation is weak. 
You have to rely on what others say instead of what you know. And what you know should be coming from the Father above, from the Father of lights. James 1, 16 through 18 says, Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth, by his word, that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. So what do we need to to guard ourselves against deception. I want to shift just a bit so that you now see the relevance of why Messiah had to come and how it pertains to the nation of Israel. This comes from Romans 7, 1 through 3. This passage was written to the brethren. It says, I speak to those who know the law, that the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives. For the woman who has a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. But if the husband dies, she is released from the law of her husband. So then if, while her husband lives, she marries another man, she will be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law so that she is no adulteress, though she has married another man. If the husband dies, please hear this. Israel was in a marriage contract and a marriage covenant. Who was she married to? She was married to Yah. Now let's look at this law in the Old Testament. This comes from Deuteronomy 24, 1-4, and this is going to show us how Israel could not be legally married to her first husband again unless he died to free her from that law. When a man hath taken a wife and married her, and it come to pass that she find no favor in his eyes, because he has found some uncleanness in her, then let him write her a bill of divorcement, and give it in her hand, and send her out of his house. This happened to Israel. And when she is departed out of his house, she may go and be another man's wife. And if the latter husband hate her, and write her a bill of divorcement, and giveth it in her hand, and sendeth her out of his house, or if the latter husband die, which took her to be his wife, listen to this, her former husband, which sent her away, may not take her again to be his wife, after that she is defiled. For that is abomination before the Most High, and thou shalt not cause the land to sin, which the Most High giveth thee for an inheritance. Would the Most High break his own law? That's a question you need to answer. He died to free Israel from this law. When was this law given? It was given when Israel was one nation. The nation fell. Yah's plan for that is redemption. So angels are sons of Yah. They are identified as such. But Yeshua is the only begotten son of Yah. There is a difference. Is the Most High taking Israel unto himself again? Or is, is he now giving her over to an angel. And this is where you have to look at the divinity of Yeshua. What made him one with the Father? There's something else to consider, his blood. The first Adam's blood came from the Father directly. The second Adam had to have that same blood. So ask the question, what made him divine? This is why we're told in Romans 11 that he has not cast away the people he foreknew. He's married to the backslider. She's an adulteress. She committed adultery with pagan gods. Pagans. But it says 
Yah hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew. So when you read Romans 11, 25 through 27, you will see that it says, All Israel shall be saved, as it is written. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. This is part of the covenant that was made with us. He promised to redeem and restore and take away our sins. This passage is talking about those he foreknew. Pay attention to the language being used. I really need you to get this part. So if you have to go back and listen a few times, please do that so that you get the understanding. The enemy will try to steal it if you don't understand. So we're looking at Romans 7, 4 through 6. It says, My brethren, you also have become dead to the law. Through what? The body of Christ. The body of Yeshua. Why? That you may be married to another, to him who was raised from the dead. We need to know who that is because we're going to be married to him. Why? That we should bear fruit unto Yah. For when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit to death. But now we have been delivered from the law, having died to what we were held by, so that we should serve in the newness of the spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. Now think about the law. According to the law, the husband had to die for the woman to be freed from the law. Who was Israel's husband? Yah was her husband. This says, you will be married to him who was raised from the dead, who died. The child that was born as the last Adam. Certainly it was not the spirit that contains everything that the father is because spirits don't die. Yah is what? A spirit. However, the fullness of him was in Messiah's body. The word was with Yah and the word was Yah. His name means Yah with us. This is why he can say, yes, I am a king and I have a kingdom. He had it before he came. Now his death made it possible for Israel to be restored unto her husband because the body that was made for him died. He had to die, just like those he came to deliver from the power of sin and death. When he was resurrected, he took that power back. He's the only begotten. And scripture says, he came from the bosom. He came from the bosom of the Father. In what form? Spirit form. But to interact in this realm, you need a body. So one was made for him. How? Mary received the word through faith. When she said, be it unto me as your word has said, he sent his word to heal and deliver us from destruction. What we're seeing is the duality of flesh and spirit. He came in the flesh because we were bearing fruit unto death. Why? Because the seed in the first Adam died spiritually. Notice that it says, we now serve in the newness of the spirit. If you can see the duality of spirit and flesh, you will understand this revelation. Let's drop down to verses 14 through 24, and you're going to see how this takes us right back to the garden 
and the war that began there. It says, we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. This is what Adam became, a carnal man, sold under sin. We inherited that because we were in him. It says, for what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I will to do, that I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. If then I do what I will not to do, I agree with the law that it is good. <laughs> the law is good. You see the battle between good and evil going on. This is a struggle that we deal with every day. The law is good because it's like an alarm going off saying wrong way, wrong way, repent and turn. However, sin lives in this flesh. Listen to verse 17. It is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. There is no good thing in our flesh. For to will is present with me. Inside, my spirit man wants to do good but I don't do it. I do the wicked things that I don't want to do. Do you see the struggle, the duality? He says, the good that I will to do, I do not do. But the evil I will not to do, that I practice. Now, if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. I find then a law that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. Do you see what he's saying here? And this is why it was so important for Yah to send the body and prepare a body, the body, the word that was made flesh, so that it could come and die, take on the sinful nature, this thing that lives, on the inside of us and then die so that we could live because there's nothing good in this flesh. You are a spirit, but you live in this body. The spirit came from where? Not this earth. It came when life was breathed into Adam, but Adam had something else on the inside of him, seed that reproduces after its kind. So you live in this container, this body, that loves sin. It wants to do evil. <laughs> Your regenerated, regenerated spirit desires to do good. You're really fighting with yourself. Here's an example. In the movie The Matrix, Smith is Neo's opposite. He was tethered to him. Neo's trying to do good. Smith is trying to do e evil. Science tries to explain this phenomenon as quantum entanglement. So then he goes on to say, I delight in the law of Yah according to the inward man, according to the spirit, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Why is he saying that? Because we inherited this from Adam. When Adam died, we were in him. This body died. It was now subjected to the law of sin and death. Messiah was the deliverer. He came to fulfill the law, to die so that Israel can now be reconciled to her husband. <clears throat> now, if she is reconciled to her husband, we have to ask, wouldn't he have to be divine initially? The son says everything that the father has is his and everything that he has belongs to the father. Let's go on. This restoration had to restore what Adam lost. That's why he came the first time. But Israel also had to be delivered. Hear this. 
the husband wasn't the husband wasn't the only one to die the nation died as well let's see this here in jeremiah 12 7 through 9 i have forsaken my house i have left my heritage i have given the dearly beloved of my soul into the hand of her enemies my heritage is to me like a lion in the forest it cries out against me therefore i have hated it my heritage is to me like a speckled vulture like a it didn't say it was the vultures all around are against her come assemble all the beasts of the field bring them to devour this is what caused the valley of the dry bones she died so that she could live again and be restored do you know what else will be restored her purity let's read this from jeremiah 31 2 through 4. the most high is speaking he's saying the people which were left of the sword found grace in the wilderness even israel when i went to cause him to rest the most high has appeared of old unto me saying yea i have loved thee with an everlasting love therefore with loving kindness have i drawn thee again i will build thee and thou shalt be built o virgin of israel thou shalt again be adorned with thy tabrets and shalt go forth in the dances of them that make merry listen family everything that's happening right now is yah's intended purpose even the struggles we're facing it's revealing something it will not be hard to figure out who belonged to him in the coming days the refiner's fire is revealing what the vessels are made of instead of being alarmed what should we be doing using the word and the spirit to test because we have to take heed how we hear we need to ask where did this come from let me check out the road and then look at what it leads to what is its ultimate end look to see if it leads back to a deceiving spirit or doctrines that came from a demon first timothy 4 1 now the spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons you have to know that these deceiving spirits they speak <laughs> they speak it's the heel catcher designed to trip you up when you studied prayed fasted waited for confirmation that comes from above you won't be tossed to and fro and if you're still not sure that's a time to seek wise counsel because you know you need to keep it moving you have a destination and you have to get there the enemy's trying to trip you up in this case you know that two cannot walk together except they agree we cannot agree with an enemy bent on our destruction i know i shared a lot family but it's important for us to be vigilant and to have an understanding about how the enemy operates we are nearing the end and we were warned about deceptions coming in the last days but know this as well the enemy sees you as a threat you're carrying something on the inside of you that threatens his kingdom we're also living in the day of separating wheat from tares and i hope you know that process is not going to be easy let's look at this from luke 12 49 through 53 messiah is speaking he said i came to send fire on the earth and how i wish it were already kindled but i have a baptism to be baptized with and how distressed i am till it is accomplished do you suppose that i came to give peace on earth listen to what he says i tell you not at all but rather division for from now on five and one house will be divided three against two and two against three 
Father will be divided against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother, mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. So I've said this many times. I'll say it again. This awakening is going to be messy. You have to know how to distinguish or discern between growing pains versus deception. There's a difference. Things that will take you away from the path of righteousness is dangerous. So no, you cannot agree to disagree about those things. You will have to recognize division that is caused by the enemy trying to prevent the forward motion of the sons of light versus division that is caused because the sword of the spirit is piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. If you ever get a check in your spirit about something you hear, don't move on from that thing until you get confirmation. We have to know that seducing spirits will speak and so will the spirit of truth. And this is why we have to learn to rightly divide the truth. We have to get to the heart of the thing. There are many questions right now about the divinity of Yeshua. It's a dividing line. As uncomfortable as it is for some, it is what many will wrestle with. Israelites wrestled with it during the days of the disciples. The apostles wrestled with other issues. It was uncomfortable, but it was not born out of hate. It was not born out of hate. You need to know that. But there are some things you need to question. How do you explain that the word became flesh? That's telling us what it was originally. And scripture tells us that the word came from the Most High's bosom. He was with the Father in the beginning. So... There are many who are torn because they're hearing that Joseph is the father. We have some who are torn because they're believing or they're hearing that Messiah was originally an angel. To believe either of those erases his divinity. Messiah tells us that he is the beginning and end. How do you reconcile that? One is truth. And the other isn't. The faith that will be shaken is what you believe about him. Who do men say that I am? We're going to continue this discussion on how to guard against end of days deception on the live this coming Wednesday, y'all willing. So be sure to join me for that. If this message has been a blessing to you, please hit the like, share it, and you're also welcome to subscribe if you have not already done so. We normally upload on Sundays at 8.30 a.m. Until next time, be blessed, family.